Dear teenagers and tweens, if you could, please come towards the front. You can come in the front. Wonderful. Yes, you can get an, another cushion and mat for yourself. Rice it right here. There you go. Win, you can sit right there. Ka. Good support for me. Dear beloved Thay, dear beloved spiritual family, I know you're here and what a gift it is to be together on the New Year's Eve. Today I would like to dedicate my sharing to the tweens and the teens so I surely hope that you will stay for the whole talk, okay? <laughs> and also, um, this is also for all the tweens and the teens in each one of us, the, the adults out there. So I also surely hope you stay for the whole talk. <laughs> the theme of the retreat is joy in oneself joy in the world and during the past few days we have learned different ways to cultivate joy so today i will also i would like to go into this theme uh, to develop it further so that we learn how to cultivate joy in ourselves I have a niece, she's going to turn 10 uh, in January. And 
and uh, she's really the, the only niece I have, so I love her a lot, and um, she's quite mature. So we talk to each other, and I, I get great delight from my conversations with her. One of the games that we play uh, is asking each other, would you rather? So we've been playing this, this game the last few years. Uh, and last week, or two weeks ago when I saw her, we played this game again. And her dad is fixing the house, so we were lying on a couch. And, um, you know, we started to ask each other, and it was quite benign at first. And then she asked me, would you rather have your parents or your brother? That's my brother who is her father. And at that moment, I was stumped right there because, you know, um, my brother and I, we lost our parents since we were children. So I never really knew my father and I lost my mother when I was 12 years old. And even before she died, I hardly lived with her. And my brother, I knew him all my life. So when my niece asked me, what, would, you rather live, would you rather have your parents or your brother your whole life? I screamed out, how dare you? And she said, Jews, Jews, your parents or your brother? Right? A nine-year-old. And so I said, okay, my brother. If I have to choose, then it's my brother. Because how can you choose something or somebody you hardly know, right? And here my brother, I've known him all my life. So I chose my brother. So when it was my turn, I wanted to get back at her. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked her, would you rather live with your daddy or with electronics? One or the other. <laughs> oh my gosh. She looked confused. She looked bewildered. She couldn't believe it. And she said, no electronics? <laughs> And I said, yeah, juice, juice. <laughs> and you know, my niece, she loves her father. They were like best friends. Since she was three, my brother said she, he could talk to her. And I think she's the one he talks to the most in his whole life. With all the women he dated, I don't think he talked to them as much. <laughs> but to his daughter, he could talk about anything and they would be on the phone for two hours and she was only three or four and I couldn't figure out what they would talk about, right? And so when we played the games, would you rather, she would always choose her father over a set of parents who are rich, you know, and would give her everything and she would say immediately, Daddy. But this time she couldn't answer. She said, like, no electronics. <laughs> And I said, yeah, choose electronics or your daddy. And you know what she did? She couldn't answer, so she tried to push me off the, cush uh, the couch. <laughs> and I actually fell down on the ground. And my brother picked me up by the head, and he said, don't you dare to push my sister off the couch. <laughs> so I'm sure as teenagers and tweens and even the adults, you find a lot of joy in electronics, don't you? Yeah? Can you even imagine your life without the internet? Huh? Without your iPads? Can you live without them? I'm very impressed that you are here with us. I'm sure that was very difficult to be far away or to be away from your electronic gadgets. But you know, I'm really happy that you are here. And I hope that your hearts are open so that you discover, or maybe you have discovered while you've been here, that 
there is a kind of joy that you can obtain, not from electronics, but from the practice, a joy that is so deep and quiet, that is so nourishing. It's not the kind of joy you get when you eat a bar of chocolate, you know, that you get a high, and then you like go crazy, and then you just kind of, you get tired afterwards. It's not that kind of joy, excitement, restlessness, but a joy, a happiness that is quiet and deep. And when I walk to the meditation hall each day, when I see the, the tents, they are like beautiful, colorful mushrooms, right? And the tents can be so small, don't you think? Some tents are just barely the size of one's body. Now, these tents are a lot smaller than the rooms in your house, right? But have you been sleeping well? Yeah, I think some of us sleep really well in nature, in the tents, when you don't have a lot of comforts, and yet your mind is relaxed, right? Your mind is at ease. You are not, your brain is not overtaxed with information, you know, with the movies, all of the things that you consume in your daily life that makes you so tired afterwards, right? Even when you go to sleep, you're exhausted and you're exhausted in your sleep. Your dreams are restless. Your dreams are full of nightmares, are full of images. And you wake up, you're tired. You don't even want to get out of bed, right? But here, you touch a joy that is very peaceful, that is very simple, just sleeping in a tent, a small tent, sleeping in a room with other strangers, being in a place like this, with no heater, <laughs> no big screens, and yet you can be so happy. Okay? So I think you experience it directly, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a lot already. So today, I would like to go into some of the ways that we can consciously, proactively generate joy in our daily life, which is very important in this time um, you know, we have gone through a pandemic for two years now, and many young people are so isolated. I met um, a young person that I took care of since she came to the monastery since she was five, and now she's already in her 20s and a, a kindergarten teacher. And she said, you know, she teaches children at the age of four and five, and they've never gone to school, a normal school. They don't know what a kindergarten, a first grade is like in person. They've been learning online. Kindergarten children is so, I mean, it's mind boggling for me. And she said, the children, they act out a lot. It's, she's been a teacher only for two years during this pandemic, and she's already very burned out because of that. Okay? So we need to acknowledge that all of us, however young or old we are, we have been going through a lot, especially the last two years. So when we talk about joy, some of us may think, what, what about joy? How can I even experience real joy? But it is possible. And there, there, there's actually, in my practice, I learned that joy is everywhere. Only that we are aware of it and we tap into it. Okay? Um, in Buddhism, we learn that the, the, a person is made up of the five aggregates, or the five components. And these are the, f the five places that we can actually cultivate and generate joy. 
So the first, the first one, we are made up of our body. The second one, feelings. Okay. The third one is our mental mental formations. Hmm. Four, five. I'll go into that more. So in the body, can you find joy in the body? Get to see you come. Hmm. The body. When we become aware, breathing in, the breath is a part of the body. The lungs are part of the body, right? When you breathe and you take it for granted, then it doesn't bring joy. But for me, mindful breathing has become my best friend. Anywhere and everywhere, anytime, wherever I am, I have learned to come back to my breath. And it's like the best friend that is always there for you. You always think, oh, can I find somebody to be my friend, to love me and accept me exactly the way I am. I can say anything and that person will understand me and will get me, right? But can you ever find anybody can be, who can be with you 24 hours a day? And if you are with somebody 24 hours a day, you may get really irritated, right? <laughs> but the breath has been there since the moment we were born until now. We have breathed millions of times, but we don't pay attention to it. But when we pay attention to the breath, the mind anchors in the breath, and the mind is not free to go off into some negative thoughts, worries, and anxieties. You see? And in Chinese character, the breath is written like this. Okay? The upper character in Vietnamese is tự, which means from and means it also means itself. Okay? And this character down here means tâm, heart, good, mind. Okay? So the breath, check this out, is the heart, the mind, is from the heart, from the mind. The breath is the heart, the mind itself. So when you're angry, how do you breathe? You breathe differently, right? Your breath is short, laborious, quick, right? And you feel it's your body, your chest is really hot. And when you're sad, you breathe differently. You sigh, like I used to, <sighs> like this when I was a child. I already suffered for a lot, and I used to sigh. And my grandma would say, "Don't keep sighing like that. This, you know, this family will go poor because you keep sighing like that." So that's a belief in Vietnam. When you keep sighing, you make your parents go poor. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the breath tells you a lot about the state of mind that you are in. You may not be aware that you are angry. You may not be aware that you are depressed. You may not be aware that you feel really bad about yourself. But, or you get drowned in those thoughts and those feelings. But when you bring your mind back to the breath, you become aware of yourself and you can follow the breath for a while, in breath, out breath, okay, I'm okay, it's going to be okay, this too shall pass, I'm here with myself, it's okay, 
You see, you talk yourself through it. You listen to your breath. And amazingly enough, when your mind is with your breath, the breath becomes calmer. And thus, your mind becomes calmer and quieter and is more manageable. Those thoughts and feelings that seem so overwhelming, they become more manageable because your mind quiets down, you see? And your breath is more comfortable. Your breathing pattern becomes more comfortable. Everything about your body tells you about your mind. The mind you cannot see, you cannot touch, you cannot smell, but you can see the mind through your whole body. When you're angry, you make a fist, right? Your hands clench up like this. When you're angry, you walk very heavily, right? Your body is so agitated in every way. Your voice, your speech, everything changes. So learning to be there for your body, to be aware of your body and of your breathing helps you to understand yourself. And guess what? When you can understand yourself, when you can be there for yourself, regardless of how you feel, it is the deepest joy. It is the greatest joy. Because when we, when we are overwhelmed by our feelings and our perceptions and our thoughts, we feel so helpless. We feel so hopeless, you know? We, we, we fall into this, this chasm, this, this chasm, this black hole of despair. It's bottomless. But when you can just stay there with your breath, you can, you can hold your body and say, it's okay, it's okay. Then right in that moment, you can actually taste joy. You can say, I can be here for myself. I can take care of myself. You see? And so by being there for your body, you are actually being there for your feelings in a concrete way. There are people who have been depressed all their lives. I was depressed for so many years of my life. And yet, if you ask me about my depression, I couldn't tell you much about it. I just, I could tell you I was depressed. But the root cause of my depression, how it affected me, how it traumatized my mind, my body, my whole life, I couldn't tell you. How I could take care of it, I couldn't tell you. I was just helpless and hopeless. But when I learned to be there, with my breathing, with my body, I gained a sense of trust and confidence in myself. I can be there. Whatever the situation is, I can be there for myself. And that is a deep joy. It's a real power that we can cultivate in our daily life. You see, this body, we may think, oh, I wish I were taller, I wish I were whatever, I wish I were Asian, I wish I were Caucasian, I, was, I wish I were black, right? We always want to be somebody, but not ourselves. We always feel quite uncomfortable in our body, uncomfortable with ourselves. But when we learn to hold our own hands, to hold our own body, and to say, I'm here, it's okay. I've learned to tell myself, I love you. I love you. So many times a day. Like before I came to this talk, instead of you know, reading more, or I don't know, the many things people do to prepare for a talk. <laughs> before, what I did, I lay in bed, and I breathed, and I told myself, I love you. That's what I did for a long time. And then I got out a massager, 
a hand massager, and I just massage myself. And I breathe and I say, I love you. Thank you for all the efforts that you make today and every day. And it just felt really calming that I could be there for myself. And it's that deep joy that I cultivate and I taste in my daily life because I can be there for my body, because I can be there for my feelings. You see? Let us enjoy one sound of the bell and just befriend your in-breath as it is, breathing in. Just befriend that in-breath. Say hello, in-breath. And as you breathe out, say hello, out-breath. Hi. A few months ago, I think it was in July, we had a family retreat. And I took care of the teenagers. And on the first day, we actually, the whole retreat, Brother Peace and I took care of these teenagers. We had all activities outdoor. So that we didn't have to wear the mask. And the first day, all the teenagers, or most of them, wore masks, even though we were outdoor. The second day, some of them removed their masks as they became more comfortable. The third day, pretty much all of them removed their masks, except two or three. Then during that retreat, I actually learned something new. Of course, we wear a mask to protect ourselves and others from transmitting the virus, right? But through this pandemic, the mask has also served another function. Have you discovered it? It is to mask our own feelings to put a distance between ourselves and others. So one particular teenager I knew, he suffered so badly anxiety during this pandemic. He was fine when he came to us in the twins program, just a fine child. But when he came back, he, be, he was in the teens program and he was so anxious it was heartbreaking. He dressed in sweatpants and sweatshirts, and his hood he would cover all the way. I don't know how he even saw the, the road, how he could walk. With the mask on and his hood tied up like this, you couldn't see his facial skin at all. And that whole time he wouldn't, he wouldn't eat with us because that, that meant he had to remove his mask. I mean, he would show up, he would sit in the corner all covered up and look away. But bless him, he showed up. He didn't show up to all activities. But when he showed up, he wouldn't make eye contact. We couldn't see his eyes even. And so slowly I befriended him and I tried to talk to him. And then on the fourth day, he actually removed his mask when he was talking with me for the first time. And as we were talking, there was a group of children, mind you, children, 
they walked by and they were many feet away. And when they, he heard the sound of the children, he was shaking so badly. He tried to put his mask on. He couldn't even put his mask on right because he was just fumbling. He was just tremoring badly. You know, such social anxiety. He suffered from. So he wore that mask actually for the whole retreat. And he only took, removed the mask one time when we were doing the beginning anew, right? And it was so revolutionary. It was such a breakthrough, you know? It was so amazing. And the teens loved him and, you know, really included him in everything. And he, 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 he did open up, he, he, he opened up a little bit, but still he, he really did not feel comfortable. So pay attention to your feelings, your thoughts. When you feel anxious, when you feel isolated, when you feel scared, like you see a bug, <laughs> a spider, what's your first reaction? What's your first reaction? Probably your heart rate. Your heart rate increases, right? Your respiratory rate respiratory rate increases, your whole body tenses up. So that's natural. That's a fight or flight or freeze response. Yeah. Or freeze stress response. So we usually adapt one of these mechanisms to respond to stress. And it also, of course, it depends on the situation, right? In some situation, naturally, your body will just fight back. And in some other situation, you just run away. So your nervous system makes that assessment very quickly. So in sometimes when you are in a very, very difficult situation, like somebody is attack attacking you or you're in an accident, you know, however the body responds, that's its wisdom in that moment. Okay? Or you simply freeze or check out or withdraw or shut down. That's the freeze response. That is to maximize your survival chance. So we all have this. And as children, sometimes we can go through such trauma too. You know, like you haven't seen your friends. You don't get to play with them, to talk with them normally, like before. Okay? Or sometimes the, the arguments between parents, uh, between you and your siblings, between you and your friends, or if they reject you, all of that can cause such you know, trauma to your body and your mind, such effects. So we go through this fight, flight, or freeze stress response. But then it can also become a, a lifelong adaptation, a lifelong coping mechanism. So sometimes we also get stuck in that fight response. So children who suffer from certain traumas grow up and just they fight constantly. They just, you know, react all the time. Even though, you know, the, the situation doesn't seem that severe, but it has become a habit, you see? Or you always run away. There are adults who run away. Whatever good thing that happens to them, they will say, I'm not good enough for it. I don't deserve it. I'm just going to run away from that person. You know, that person loves me. No, that person doesn't really love me. Or I don't, you know, I don't deserve that person. So you run away. Or that job or that degree, I can't, I can't do it. So you're almost there, you're almost finished, and yet you walk away. Because you don't feel that you deserve it. 
And it all can take place very early on in our life. And it becomes a habit, a pattern. And we act as if, oh, that's just the way I am. That's how I think. But it is not who you are. It has its deep root from within. You see? Now, now that you are young, as teenagers and as tweens, as young adults, and when you recognize this, oh, I'm in a fight res- response right now. I'm in a fight mode. I have adapted this flight mechanism or this check out withdrawn mechanism. So your first response, instead of going into this immediately, you can actually learn to just breathe. Okay, something very scary just happened. Okay, just breathe. Just be still. You know, just relax. It's okay. So if you, something, something happens in that moment, and instead of going into one of these responses, you can come back to your breath, and you can relax your body, and you can talk, calm down your feelings. You can talk yourself through it. You actually don't have to get stuck in it, in this moment, or years to come. You see what I mean? You recognize it in that very moment. Or even if it has become a habit for you, you can also call it by its true name. Oh, it's a fight response. I've done this for many years of my life. Breathe. It's okay. I don't have to be a victim anymore. You see? So it's so incredibly important for us to be aware of this. Now, like my niece, Sune, she has already learned to, nowadays, neuroscientists, people use the word self-regulate. It means to just calm the body and the mind, okay? To bring it back into equilibrium. She has already learned to self-regulate, to calm her emotions with YouTubes, <laughs> with movies, with games. You know, she said, I need to relax. That means I need to go to my electronics. Okay, I need to relax. Yes, it is a way to relax for sure. But it is also a way to escape ourselves. You see? Because when you feel so full, right? Full of emotions, full of negative thoughts and judgments towards yourself or others, yeah, you go, you watch a movie, you play a video game, you do whatever, so you forget about it, the situation. But the movies that you watch, the games that you play, also have its own content, right? Of violence, or of despair, or of sadness, or of restlessness, right? It has its own triggering effects. So in that moment, you forget about situation, but it's like a cup that is full, and then you pour more water in, and so it just spills out and spills out, you see? So that's what we do. We escape ourselves by going to entertainment, going to the social media, going to do something to forget ourselves. But that doesn't doesn't empty the cup. It just makes the cup keep feeling full, you see? And when you go back to school, or you go back to your homework, or you go back to your situation, you're stressed all over again. And then, so what do you do? Then you want to escape it. Then you want to go back to your electronics. So it creates a vicious cycle, and it creates miserable feelings in us. So if we learn to come back to our body and relax it, you lie down, like deep relaxation, you relax, you say, it's okay, relax, I'm here, you know? These feelings that cause me angst, you know, pain right here, or it causes me to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm choking, right? Your, your, your throat feels really tight, or your, you, know, you feel there's a knot right here, you know, underneath your sternum or underneath, underneath your belly button, right? You feel like there's a knot right there or really tight in your body. 
you breathe and you say, relax, it's okay, it's okay, I'm sorry you're feeling this way, I'm sorry, help me to take better care of you. You're actually taking care, truly taking care of yourself. You're actually alleviating, emptying the thoughts and the feelings, calming them down. For the present moment, you're taking care, and also later, the next day, one year later, five years later, when you think back of that experience, if you practice with it, then you have a feeling of peace, a feeling of confidence. Oh, I was able to take care of myself. I am able to take care of myself. You see? But if you go through a traumatic experience in your body and in your mind, now, tomorrow when you think of it, your body goes into stress again. Five years later, ten years later, when you recall the experience, the trauma takes place all over again. Does it make sense? So let us listen to one sound of the bell, and then let's say there's a feeling that is arising that is quite unpleasant. So instead of reacting to it, of running away from it, escaping it, or getting drowned in it, let us learn to use our first response as the breath. Go back to the breath. Just say, like breathe, breathe, relax. I can take care of this. It's okay. Relax the body. And so you are relaxing the feelings, giving it time and space. <coughs> and that to me is real joy. It's like when you're eating broccoli or <laughs> carrots or tofu. It's not very exciting, but you know it's good for you. <laughs> and you don't get a stomach afterwards, you know? And if you chew slowly, the broccoli actually is quite sweet, right? And it's quite tasteful, tasty, right? Yeah? So it's like that. That's the joy of practice. It's like eating broccoli. <laughs> One time a teenager, he came to the group, the Dharma sharing uh, group, and then he said, Sister D, today I ate a cookie, my favorite kind of cookie, very mindfully, and it tasted like cardboard. <laughs> and it's true, the things that you like, like Cheetos or whatever, pizza or so, it's good only because you eat it very fast. <laughs> and because you are playing your, your video games or watching your movie or your talking, it's only good because you are doing it with forgetfulness. You see? But when you eat it slowly, you're like, Yuck! What am I eating? Ah, so it's like that for many things in our lives. We think it brings us happiness, it makes us, you know, happy, whatever. But when you look deeply into it, when you really see it for what it is, you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I watching these movies one after another? You know, they don't have any meaning. They don't really nourish me. I feel sick. I haven't gone to the toilet for the last three, five hours. You know, watching one movie after another. Why am I doing this to myself? And when you can ask yourself that, 
that to me is enlightenment. Okay? Help. We think that our parents are supposed to take care of us, right? Yes, they're supposed to take care of us. And some of them do a pretty good job, and some of them, they're not capable of taking good care of us because they're not able of taking good care of themselves. You see? But we have to be proactive. We have to learn because even if our parents do our best to take care of us, and if we don't want to, we don't help them, they cannot take care of us. So I hope when you become more and more aware of the deep joy, the broccoli, the carrot joy, and you choose that because you see that the other kind of the chocolate joy, you know, the electronics joy is not real joy, then you ask your parents, Mom, can you please lock up my iPad? <laughs> can, you just please, can you just give me one hour a day access to it? Just one hour a day or something, you know? I mean, it will be revolutionary if you can do that. It will be very difficult to do that. But that is true love. Because I work with a lot of young people and I see how it affects the development of your brain. Your brain is like, is full of potential. It's limitless. And yet when we pay attention only to certain things like we play video games, we watch movies, whatever. You know, my niece is so good. I mean, she serves through, she can go on Google and type in my name and you know, check out all the talks that I've given. She does it so fast, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> she, she's so good at it. And the young people nowadays are so good at it. But when you're so good at that one thing, but you don't go out, and play, you know, play basketball, play volleyball, you don't jog, you don't swim, you don't interact with friends, you don't, you know, go to nature. Like, you're only good at one thing, a few things, and the rest of you is neglected. You're not developed. You become socially awkward. Okay, you become emotionally fragile you're not able to take care of your own emotions. Whatever you encounter, you just freak out because you are not used to that. And so you escape. You have your escape. But wherever you go, there you are. You cannot escape yourself. You just keep running into yourself again and again. And that's suffering, you see? So I think of this image. Look, think of a tree, like the poplar tree. Okay. Huh? And it has, you know the, the poplar trees come from the seeds, right? These seeds. And one seed developed into this tree. So a seed can give rise to a tree. And then the tree will give seeds, right? And they will fall down and they will give rise to another tree. Well, when we go through a difficult experience, let's say a trauma, trauma from being isolated, trauma from being abused, trauma from being rejected by a friend, by our own parents, by our own children, by a loss of a pet, or a loss of a grandma, a loss of a loved one. You see, that, that's the seed of suffering that has planted in us. And it will manifest as certain habits, as certain coping mechanism. Then we just want to withdraw. We want to close the doors of our room. We don't want to go out, you see? so. Habits, habits will be developed from that. Okay. These are the habits. 
and this is like the difficult situation or the trauma. Because when we have, we experience a very difficult event, the body will tense up, right? The body contracts. There are very difficult feelings, right? And mental formations that we have anger or we have sadness, we have pain, we doubt ourselves, we no longer have confidence. So these are different mental states, you see? And then the fourth one is the perceptions. The perceptions. Oh, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to be happy. That was my fault. Whatever that happened to me, to me, that was my fault. I brought it upon myself. So we blamed ourselves. You see? Mm -hmm. So we go through all this. And the fifth component that make, a, make up us, that's consciousness, our mind, our mind. We become hyper-vigilant. We become very aloof. We become scared. So that trauma is like a seed in our mind, in our consciousness. And then it will manifest as certain habits we would draw. We escape through electronics. Some of us, like I myself, I used to bite my nail all the way down. That when I wash my hands, it felt like electric shock. You know? Or I used to pull my hair. And I actually caused myself a bald, a bald spot for many years. See? So see this in yourself. What kind of things that your body are telling you that is going through trauma? See? And acknowledge it. Breathing in, I'm aware that I'm carrying pain and sadness hmm? in my chest. I feel like I cannot breathe. Hmm. Huh? Or feel, breathing in, I feel pain in my belly every time I get upset. Okay, breathing out. I put my hands on my belly and I say, it's okay, I'm here. Help me to take good care of you. It's okay, relax, I'm safe now. You see, I love you. I love you. So we learn to develop new habits that are more positive, that are more nurturing, that are more healing, you see? Because the trauma can develop certain habits, and these habits, the, these trees will give to seeds, more seeds, you see? And then they will grow more trees. So they just go like a vicious cycle. Like I, I saw a documentary. It touched me a lot about you know, sex trafficking. And this trafficker was interviewed. And he said, when I go, I go to like a crowded place, like a bus station, a train station, and I see a young girl standing by herself. I walk up to her and I'll, ask, I'll say to her, oh, your eyes look beautiful. And if she looks at me and she smiles and say, thank you, then I know I have no chance. I walk away. But if I walk to another girl and say the same thing, your eyes look beautiful. And if that girl or that boy looks down and say, no, they don't, I know I got her. I know I got her. You see, just your one response, it can determine your life, a life of freedom or a life of servitude. So we need to learn to look at ourselves in the mirror each day, to hold our own hands, to hold our own body, and to say, I'm here for you. You okay? You're good enough.
thank you for all the efforts you're making. If you can do that, you are your own soulmate. You are your own best friend. And when somebody comes along and says something like that to you, oh, you look beautiful, you say thank you. Or if somebody says, oh, you look ugly, you're like, that's your opinion. (laughs) (laughs) Or you just smile and don't give whatever. Don't give it power, right? Because you know it's not true. You see, somebody can only get you because you let that person get to you. That's what I have learned. We are the worst to ourselves. We say very mean things to ourselves. Maybe somebody in our family said mean things to us as we were growing up. But then we are the ones who will continue those mean things, say, you're stupid, you're not good enough, you're this and that, you see? But we can learn to undo that and to say, thank you. Thank you for being alive. Thank you for trying. Thank you for being here. I love you. You are enough. You know what? I've even learned to say, you are whole. I no longer feel that I lack anything. I don't have to compare myself to anybody else. You know, even when you say, oh, I'm just as good as her, you're still comparing yourself. You say, oh, you know, he's better than me. You're comparing yourself. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not good like, you know, that next person. You're still comparing yourself, you see? So it's like we go through life putting ourselves on auction or something. putting ourselves on auction again and again. Oh, look at me, I'm not, you know, take me. Give me some value, some acknowledgement. I'll be your slave. But when we practice, we can be there for our five aggregates of body, feelings, of different mental states, of our perceptions, of our mind. We take care of it. That, to me, is the deepest joy, the greatest power, the power to trust oneself, to trust that we will not neglect ourselves, we will not abandon ourselves, we will not abuse ourselves. Whatever people have done to us, they are gone. Let us not be, let us not continue that trauma or that abuse. You see? Let us give ourselves a new chance every moment by coming back to the breath, coming back to the body, being there for whatever that is arising in our thoughts and our feelings, and to say, I love you. I'm whole. Keep trying. Let's water only the good seeds in our mind, in my mind. Let not water the seed of despair, of violence, of hatred. Let's be kind. You see, I have learned to choose that. When we're scared, when we're afraid, we tend to reject ourselves, and we, of course, we reject others. Whatever we do to ourselves, we do to others. And whatever we do to others, surely we are doing it to ourselves. But if, if every moment you learn to embrace yourself, to be kind to yourself, 
and your first response will not be the fight, the flight, or the freeze response. Your first response is not exclusion. It's not pushing away. It's not wishing the situation to be gone, the person to be gone, yourself to be gone. But, but your first response is to come back to your breath, to your body, to your feelings, and just to be there for them. And to say, it's okay. Whatever happens, I can be there for myself. And I trust. Because I've done it one time, I can do that again and again. And that is a deep, deep joy, you know. It's 8.33. So, okay, let us enjoy one half the bell. So let us take the last few minutes for me to ask uh, some of the twins and the teenagers, like from being here the last few days, or from this talk also, can you share one of the ways that you can cultivate joy in yourself? Can you raise your hands, Cam? Help me out. Can you share? Yes. How? One of the ways that you see you can cultivate deep joy in yourself. Being around people that you care about. Good. And people that in general just have a fun time with. And what's the second way, Kang? Oh, just people that I uh, like to have fun with. Okay, so be around people that I care about, that I have fun with. Wonderful. That's to go togetherness. You know, when we, when we practice by ourselves, like all of these exercises, like I've shared with you, and then when we practice with others, like when we are in a spiritual family like this, even though we may not know each other's names, even though we may not know each other's story. But you know what? Being like this, when we walk quietly together, when we sit quietly together, we feel safe. You see? It's amazing. You actually feel relaxed and you feel safe. And that is so essential to healing. When we can feel safe in the presence of others, and feel safe in ourselves. We feel safe to ourselves. That's when healing can actually take place. But when we tense up, we're nervous all the time, or we're so isolated all the time, it's very difficult to heal. Okay. So being together with those you, those you love, those that can make you feel happy in a healthy way, that is very important to your growth and to your healing. Okay, what's another way, Ka? Um, self affirmations. Self affirmation. Like what? What kind of things can you tell yourself? I'm worthy of love. I am worthy of love. Yes, my dear, you're very worthy of love. 
Have you been telling yourself that since the last retreat? Sometimes. Here and there. Okay. Yep, I'm worthy. I'm worthy of love. Okay, come. Okay. What about you, Lana? Staying off social media. <laughs> wow. Huh? And what else can? It can bring you know, there's a lot of negative stuff. Like it, it can bring a lot of negative stuff, yeah, right? Like negative thoughts. Negative thoughts. Thoughts. Okay. Stay off social media. It can bring up a lot of negative thoughts. Anything come? <coughs> Treating my body with respect. Treat my body with respect. Like eating foods that are healthy and like getting sleep. Eating foods that are healthy and getting enough sleep. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Go, John. Just being kind with others. Being kind with others. Wonderful. Like one of, what are some of the ways you can show your kindness? Just being respectful to everybody, or trying to at least. Okay. So trying to, being, trying to be respectful to everybody, right? And that also shows respect towards yourself, right? When you respect yourself, naturally you will respect others. And when you respect others, that is respecting yourself. Wonderful, Gang. Okay. Anybody else? What's one way you can cultivate joy and happiness in yourself? Getting a deeper understanding of yourself. Gaining a deeper understanding of yourself. Gaining a deeper understanding of yourself. Yay! Wonderful. Okay, come. Please. Can you hear that? It's such an art to hear through the mask. Okay, would you say it again, Gang? Mm. Yeah, surrounding yourself with people that can make you happy instead of being with people who bring you down. Wonderful, exactly. And you know what? When you, when you think positively about yourself, you actually attract people. Who, who think positively about themselves and who show that respect and kindness to you, you see? So we have to do it for ourselves. Otherwise, if we think negatively about ourselves, like that girl who said, no, my eyes don't look beautiful, you know? Some people, they prey on that. They see the way you walk, the way you look, the way you talk about yourself, and they judge you. They say, oh, you know, that person I can bully. That person I can take advantage of. That person I can discriminate. You see? So like our own trauma begets further trauma because of the way we carry ourselves. And unkind people, they will take advantage of that. But when we learn to embrace our own pain, like our teacher taught, pain is inevitable. Okay? When you have pain in the body, you cannot avoid that. When you, pain, you have pain in your feelings, as human beings, we will always have certain pain. When you lose something, you lose somebody, when something happens. So pain is inevitable. But suffering, is optional. Okay? Suffering is optional. It means that we don't have to develop the habits of putting ourselves down, of perpetuating that abuse, that trauma, of 
making ourselves vulnerable to people's rejection and abuse, you see? Because we can hold ourselves. We have respect and dignity in ourselves. And we trust we can take care of ourselves. We don't auction ourselves off. I don't have to compare myself with anybody. If somebody who's more talented to me, oh, I'm so glad, okay? If I'm good at somebody, something, I love doing it, then I keep developing it. But I don't have to compare myself to others, you see? Because all of us are all different. We don't have to be like anybody else. We only need to be ourselves, the best of ourselves. And that is a deep, deep joy, okay? So, thank you, my dear ones. So let us enjoy three sounds of the bell and touch that deep truth, deep wisdom that we have in our body, hmm? we have in our, on our mind. We know what we need to do to take better care of ourselves. And we know that there are others, that the whole universe is there to help take care of us. We deserve to grow up in a healthy way, to be happy, to be peaceful. And we want to choose that. Okay? It's a practice. It's a daily choice. Nobody can give it to you. It's all there, but you just have to acknowledge it. You have to generate it. You have to bring it to yourself. Joy is in your body. Joy is there in your feelings, in your thoughts. You just have to choose it in a positive way. Let us enjoy three sounds of the bell. Thank you.